Hello, BDQs. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. BK for you. And today, I am here to discuss about the kidneys and the ureter. Now, our learning objectives for today with respect to kidney will be mainly a short introduction delineating about the the situation functions of the kidney, then the position of the kidney, the vertebral level of the kidney, then mainly the coverings of the kidney, the various coverings of the kidney, then the presenting parts, <coughs> the morphology, the external morphology of the kidney, that is the border surfaces and all those things. Then, followed by the, the relations of the kidney, it is related to what are all the organs in front and behind. Then, followed by that, the structure of the kidney, macroscopic structure. Then, most importantly, the blood supply of the kidney, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage, and then the applied aspects or the clinical aspects. Now, we all know that from our school days we would have learned that kidney produces urine. We have a pair of kidneys, right and left kidney, a bead shaped organ which is situated retroperitoneally, so on the posterior abdominal wall behind the peritoneal cavity. Paravertebral in position, so that is on either side of the vertebral column. It is actually reddish brown in color, and the main functions of the kidney are removal of nitrogen waste products from the circulation. That is one of the main function of the kidney by production of urine. This urine is actually conveyed by the ureters to the urinary bladder and from the bladder it is actually evacuated by the process of mixturition. So mixturition is actually evacuating the bladder through the urethra whereas production of urine is actually called as urination. Then it also serves other functions by the production of ready, it helps to control the blood flow and blood pressure. So mainly this is by the juxtra glomerular apparatus or JG apparatus. The regulation of the blood flow and the blood pressure. Then it secretes erythropoietin which is helpful in the maturation of RBCs. Then it also secretes what 25 colocalciferol, hydroxychloroclalciferol, which is responsible for maintaining the calcium metabolism. So that the indirectly influences the parathyroid hormone. So naturally, it subserves the function of an endocrine gland. With a short introduction, I will directly move on to the anatomy of the kidney. The vertebral extent of the kidney is from the T12 vertebra to the L3 vertebra, 12th thoracic to the 3rd lumbar vertebra. The right kidney is slightly lower than the left one because it is displaced slightly lower due to the presence of the liver. Fetal kidney again is at a lower position. Then, as growth proceeds, ascent of kidney takes place because the metadephros, human kidney is actually developed from the metadephros, is at a lower lumbar level. Then, slowly it ascends. Okay, fetal kidney, the kidneys are at a lower level and the bladder is at a higher level. It is abdominal in position. So, right kidney as I told is slightly lower than the left hand. Left kidney is longer and narrower as compared to the right kidney. 
the hilum of the DP where the structures, maybe the renal vessels and the ureter enter and leave the kidney lies along the transpyloric plane. This transpyloric plane passes through the upper part of the hilum with respect to the right kidney and lower part of the hilum with respect to the left kidney. That is because both the kidneys are not present exactly at the same level. Transpyloric plate L1 vertebra so actually passes to the hilum, upper part of the hilum of the right kidney and lower part of the hilum for the left kidney. The long axis of the kidney is directed downwards and laterally. It is not vertically downwards. It is downwards and laterally because the medial end is nearer to the vertebral column and the, sorry, the upper end, the upper pole is nearer to the vertebral column and the lower pole is actually away from the vertebral column. The dimensions are 11 centimeters in length, 6 centimeters breadth, 3 centimeters in thickness. The normal average kidney, these are the dimensions and it weighs around 150 grams. Coverings of the kidney, it is mainly covered by the renal capsule, first from within outwards, internally the first structure is the first covering is the renal capsule, then outer to the renal capsule you have periodific fat, then next what we have is the renal fascia, false capsule of the kidney, then we have the paradific fat. So, whenever the coverings of the kidney is asked, these are the four coverings which has to be mentioned. The renal capsule, peridephric fat, renal fascia and paradephric fat. The renal capsule is actually a condensation of the fibrous stroma of the gland. Then, after covering the fibrous stroma, after covering the external to the kidney, it passes through the hilum and lights the renal sinuses. It is a space immediately deep to the hilum you can see renal sinus which I will be explaining after a couple of slides. The renal sinuses and after lighting the renal sinus it reflects onto the minor and major calices and also the pelvis of ureter. That is about the fibrous capsule. That is about the fibrous capsule. The kidney actually moves during respiration. So, around 1 to 1.5 centimeters, the kidney moves during respiration. And not only that, the kidney moves to a higher level in a recumbent position, and when we are in erect or static position, it moves slightly downwards. In a highly mobile kidney or in a defrofaxy operation, the capsule is stripped, peeled, and sutured to the last rib. The capsule is peeled and sutured to the last rib. So, as to fix a highly mobile kidney. Second thing, in case of hydrodephros, when the urine is actually collected within the kidney to relieve pressure on the tubules also, the capsule is actually stripped. Okay. So, that is about the fibrous capsule or the true capsule of the kidney. Next is the peridephric fat which is seen along the lateral border and in the renal sinus. So this space what you see immediately deep to the hilum is the renal sinus which consists of these structures. As I told you I will be speaking about it after a couple of minutes or slides. Okay. So mainly along the lateral border the peridephric fat and also the peridephric fat is present along the renal sinus. So, usually fat mainly it is present because it acts as a loose 
packing material. This peridephric fat is present between the true capsule and the renal fascia. So this is the kidney which is immediately invested by the true capsule. This double layered lining you are able to see is the renal fascia. So between the renal fascia and the true capsule you see the peridephric fat. So mainly see the log posteriorly and along the renal sinus. Next coming to the renal fascia which is also called as the fascia of Gerota. It consists of an anterior layer and it has a posterior layer. It is nothing but the extra peritoneal connective tissue which is condensed around the kidney. The anterior layer is actually called as the fascia of told. And the posterior layer is actually called as the fascia of Zuckerkan. Okay, so both the layers of the renal fascia are fascia of Gerota. So when we try to trace the renal fascia, laterally it fuses with the fascia transversalis. So laterally it fuses with the fascia transversalis. Medially, the anterior layer that is the fascia of toad is thin and it is continuous with the same anterior layer of the opposite side crosses the midline and it is continuous with the fascia of the opposite side. Posterior layer medially what happens fuses with the psoas fascia. So this is your psoas major muscle fuses with the psoas fascia. So medially the anterior and posterior layer they don't fuse. Anterior layer continues with the anterior layer of the renal fascia of the opposite kidney. Posterior layer fused with the psoas fascia laterally and medially. Above, when you trace at the upper pole of the kidney, both the layers they fuse, but again they split to enclose the suprarenal gland. Then, after enclosing the suprarenal gland, it again fuses and gets attached to the lower surface of diaphragm as the suspensory ligament of suprarenal gland. So that is why the highly mobile kidney, the gland is not displaced. The suprarenal gland, only the kidney gets displaced. Okay. So that is the superior tracing of the renal fascia. Inferiorly, both the layers are lost in the extra peritoneal tissue. Okay. So that is about the renal fascia, anterior layer continuous medially with the opposite side, posterior layer fusing with the psoas fascia and the vertebra. Laterally, both the layers fuse continuous with the fascia transversalis. Below, lost in the extra peritoneal tissue. Above, they fuse and split again to enclose the suprarenal gland, and again they fuse. It gets attached to the subdiaphragmatic fascia, the suspensory ligament of suprarenal gland. Then, external to the renal fascia, you see the paradephric fat, which is concentrated mostly on the posterior surface. So, between the thoracolumbar fascia and the posterior surface of the kidney, you see the paradephric fat, which is external to the renal fascia. Coming to the presenting parts, it has got two ends or poles, upper pole and the lower pole, two surfaces, anterior surface and the posterior surface, two borders, lateral border and the medial border. So medial border and the lateral border, anterior surface and the posterior surface, two ends, upper pole and the lower pole. Now we will come to the these presenting parts one by one. The first thing is the posterior surface. Posterior surface is flat and mainly related to the posterior abdominal wall structures. It can be divided posterior surface in the upper part which is related to the diaphragm, ribs and the costodiaphragmatic recess of pleura. Okay. Costodiaphragmatic recess of pleura. So here you are able to see 
which is mainly related to the 11th and 12th rib. Left kidney is related to the 11th and 12th rib. Right kidney is related only to the 12th rib. Then it is related to the diaphragm, mainly the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments and the costodiaphragmatic recess of pleura. So, 12th rib alone for the right side. Costovertebral trigone is a opening due to the deficiency in the diaphragm. When the diaphragm fails to arise from the lateral arcuate ligament, then what happens is the kidney might herniate through this costovertebral trigone. Bogdalax hernia of the diaphragm. Okay. That is called as the costovertebral trigone. Failure of the diaphragm to arise from the lateral arcuate ligament. So, the lower part of the posterior surface will be related medially to the psoas major, laterally to the quadratus lumborum, and more laterally to the fascia transversalis. So, this is covered by psoas fascia, quadratus lumborum covered by anterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia, and more laterally fascia. Transversalis covering the transverse abdominis. Now, between the muscle and the fascia, it is related to certain nerves that is between the muscle and the fascia, it is related to subcostal vessels and nerves, ilio hypogastric, ilio inguinal, and fourth lumbar artery that is only on the right side. Mainly remember three nerves, subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric nerve and ilioinguinal nerves. So posterior surface is flat, not irregular. Upper part related to the diaphragm, 11th and 12th rib on the left side, 12th rib alone from the right side. Lower part of the posterior surface, medially related to psoas major, quadratus lumborum and more laterally the transverse abdominis. So, all these muscles will be covered by the fascia. Between the muscle and the fascia, you have the subcostal vessels and nerves, iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerve. Posterior surface, you also come across this renal angle, the angle formed between the 12th rib and the lateral border of erector spinae group of muscles. Okay. The renal angle is the angle between the 12th rib and the erector spinae group of muscles. So, posterior surface of the lower part of the kidney lies along this angle. The renal colic pain usually starts from here, loin region. This region is actually called as the loin region. The renal pain radiates from loin to groin. The groin is actually the fold of the thigh. Between the abdomen and the lower limb, you have the fold of the which is called as the groin. The pain radiates from loin to groin, that is because of the segmental innervation. Sympathetics from T10 to L1 or L2. So, that is why the pain radiates from loin to groin. And the posterior approach of the kidney is also through this renal angle, retroperitoneal approach to the kidney by the surgeon because below the 12th rib, this area, you don't have much muscles here. Second thing, it is not related to the pleura, the costodiaphragmatic recess does not extend here. Okay, but the surgeon should be very careful to locate the 12th rib because sometimes what happens, 12th rib is very short, it won't come beyond the lateral border of erector spinae. In that case, you will be counting the 11th rib and it will be mistaken for 12th rib and if you approach the kidney, you will be approaching at a higher level, which might lead to pneumothorax. Okay, so if the 12th rib is too short, then the 11th rib will be mistaken for 12th rib and naturally during posterior approach of kidney there is a chance of rupturing the pleura leading to pneumothorax. So that is the importance of the renal angle 
we finished the posterior surface now we are actually moving on to the anterior surface so as it is a retro peritoneal organ so many viscera they are related to the anterior surface and the relations of the anterior surface is different for both the right kidney and the left kidney anterior surface mainly is not smooth it is somewhat irregular because it is related to so many viscera so near to the hilum you can see the second part of the duodenum near to the upper pole we can see the suprarenal area upper lateral part it will be related to the liver hepatic area lower lateral part it is related to the right colic flexure it is a non peritoneal area hepatic area is a peritoneal area then colic area non peritoneal duodenum non peritoneal then lower medial part jejunal area so duodenal suprarenal hepatic colic and jejunal it is related mainly to the five areas you can see anterior relation of the right kidney now coming to the anterior relations of the left kidney it has six areas the six areas are again suprarenal area near to the upper pole then upper lateral part splenic area splenic area in between these two you have the gastric area okay then across the hilum you can see the body of the pancreas and the splenic vessels below and laterally you have the left colic flexion below and medially you have the coils of intestine that is the jejunal area so totally six areas gastric suprarenal splenic colic jejunal pancreatic okay three areas now the one more way to remember is it is related to three glands the three glands are the suprarenal spleen and the pancreas it is related to three parts of the git from the foregut stomach from the midgut jejunum from the hindgut the left colic flexure so that is about the relations of the left kidney anterior relations of the left kidney coming to the poles of the kidney upper pole is somewhat thick and rounded as compared to the lower pole and it is nearer to the midline 2.5 cm lateral from the median plane at the level of e12 it is thick and rounded lower pole is 7.5 cm away from the midline it is somewhat pointed and narrow and it is just 2.5 cm above the iliac crest opposite the l3 lower level of the kidneys at the third lumbar vertebra 2.5 cm above the iliac crest and 7.5 cm away from the median plane next coming to the borders medial border you see an indentation which is actually called as the hilum the hilum corresponds to the first lumbar vertebra hilum levis at the level of transpyloric plane l1 vertebra the hilum structures present in the hilum are from before backwards more anteriorly you see the renal vein then the renal artery and more posteriorly what you see is the pelvis of ureter from before backwards or anterior to posterior renal vein renal artery and pelvis of ureter very essential for identification of the site of the kidney now here you have to remember one more point is one branch of renal artery and one tributary of renal vein as a rule passes behind the pelvis of ureter one branch of renal artery and one tributary of renal vein will pass behind the ureter in the hilum 
so you should not get confused as that is the anterior part when you see that branches you should look for the main renal artery and the renal vein while side determinate the kd and you see notches or indentations near the hilum hilum has got a, a ventral lip or anterior lip with two notches and posteriorly you see one notch the hilum that is developmental in nature lateral border of the kidney is relatively avascular convex and lies at a more posterior plane the transverse plane if you look it goes laterally and backwards the lateral border is more resting on to the posterior abdominal wall whereas the medial border is somewhat anterior so we have discussed about the surfaces anterior surface and posterior surface upper pole lower pole of the kidney medial border the lateral border medial border especially the hilum of the kidney the relations of the kidney we have seen coverings of the kidney we will go on to the internal structure this is actually a coronal section of the kidney which divides the kidney to anterior and posterior halves mainly you see the renal sinus and the renal substance the renal substance mainly consists of the cortex and the medulla the outer part near to the surface is actually called as the cortex the inner medulla you see these pyramids pyramidal shaped structures cortex and the medulla you are able to see so mainly consists of the renal sinus and the renal substance cortex of the kidney mainly what you see here is made up of renal columns and cortical arches the medulla consists of the pale structures pyramids the pyramids as a apex and base near to the cortex between the medulla or the pyramids you see the cortical tissue extending they are actually called as the renal columns cortex extending between the pyramids is actually called as the renal columns that they extend up to this space which is the renal sinus cortical arches are that part of the cortex which is arching over the base of the pyramid okay which is arching over the base of the pyramid is actually called as the cortical arches or lobules of the kidney this arches as a superficial zone and a deeper zone near the deeper zone you see the juxta medullary nephrons okay so you have cortical nephrons you also have juxta medullary nephrons juxta means they are actually juxtaposed they are at the zone between the cortex and the medulla so that is why they are called as juxta medullary nephrons the loop of henle of the juxta medullary nephrons will have a long loop which can be seen in the pyramids so these are the renal columns part of cortex arching over the pyramids are actually called as cortical arches the cortical arch has a deeper zone at a superficial zone the deeper zone mainly consists of the juxta medullary nephrons like the cortex extending between the pyramids as renal columns the medullary portion also extend into the cortex in the form of medullary rays so these are actually called as the medullary rays they are somewhat triangular in nature the apex pointing near to the surface on either side of the medullary rays you have the interlobular arteries they are the interlobular arteries what medullary lay with two interlobular arteries on either side is actually called as the lobule of the kidney it is actually called as the lobule of the kidney don't confuse lobule of the kidney with the cortical lobules 
The medullary rays mainly rich in straight nodules and covered sweat of the collecting depths. Cortex consists of juxta medullary nephrods. The cortex also consists of the convoluted parts, the bobex capsule. Then the medullary rays mainly consists of the straight tubules and the covered sweat of the collecting ducts. Coming to the medulla, it is mainly made up of pyramids. And in between the pyramids, what you see is the renal columns. Each pyramid has a base and an apex. The apex is pointed and it is called as the renal papillae. There are 8 to 12 pyramids. So, this is actually called as the renal papillae. The pointed end is actually called as the renal papillae, which will be pierced by the ducts of Bellini. The renal papillae is actually pierced by the ducts of Bellini and it is cupped by the minor calyx. So, each minor calyx will receive 2 to 3 pyramids. Okay. So, that receives the renal papillae, the minor calyx receives the renal papillae, renal papillae is pierced by the ducts of Bellini. Then two to three minor calyx will actually unite to form major calyx. Okay? And they unite to form major calyx, unite to form the renal pelvis or the starting point of the ureter, pelvis of ureter. Pyramids mainly consist of loop of Henle. You have long as well as the short loop of Henle collecting ducts and the ducts of Bellini. That is mainly you are able to see in the pyramids. Consist of long and short loop of Henle's. Long loop of Henle's with the juxta medullary nephrons. Then we have the collecting ducts and the ducts of Bellini. A renal lobe is actually a pyramid with the cortical tissue surrounding it is actually called as a renal lobe. So, we have seen about the renal substance coming to the renal sinus you are able to see here the renal sinus is occupied by the pelvis of ureter, major calyx, minor calyx they are all lined by the capsule, two capsule of the kidney. Then you have the renal vessels and lymphatics and nerves. We have the renal vessels, lymphatics, nerves, major calyx, minor calyx uniting to form the renal pelvis and one more thing is the periliferic fat which is also a conduct of renal sinus. So, renal sinus is immediately deep to the hilum. This area which is occupied by the renal vessels pelvis of ureter, major calyx, minor calyx and periliferic fat. Renal pelvis is actually a funnel shaped dilatation which receives renal papillae. The renal papillae opens to the minor calyx. So, 11 to 13 minor calyx in each kidney. These minor calyx open into major calyx which are 2 to 3 in each kidney. The major calyx unite to form the pelvis of ureter which is a funnel shaped dilatation passing downwards and medially emerging through the hilum. The pelvis of the ureter continues as the abdominal part of the ureter. Next, coming to the blood supply of the kidney. Each kidney is supplied by renal artery, right side right renal artery and left side left renal arteries. They are branches of abdominal aorta. Once the renal artery enters the hilum, it divides into segmental branches. Okay. Daily they divide into anterior and posterior. The anterior gives four branches, one, two, three and four segmental branches. The posterior one gives only a single branch, one posterior branch. They are called as the vascular or segmental branches. So, the vascular segments of kidney are four anteriorly and only one posteriorly. Four anterior apical, upper anterior, middle anterior and inferior. 
only what behind posterior segment. The segmental branches are yet the arteries. The anterior branches and the posterior segmental branch they don't anastomose. So you have a avascular plane along the lateral border, which is actually called as the brodel's line. Again, I will repeat: renal artery. What enters the hilum divides into segmental branches. First, what anterior, posterior. The anterior divides into four segmental, posterior only single. Four anterior segmental are apical, upper anterior, middle anterior, and inferior. Posteriorly only one segment. The segmental branches they do not anastomose. So along the lateral border of kidney you have the avascular bladder slide. So kidney also can be approached laterally. So there is no anastomose. They are all end arteries. The segmental arteries, but the segmental veins they anastomose. Now, these segmental arteries, before piercing the renal substance, that is the cortex or the medulla, they divide into interlobar arteries. They actually divide into interlobar arteries. These interlobar arteries. What happens is from the lobar branches, interlobar arteries. The interlobar arteries they divide dichotomously as arcuate arteries, arching over the pyramids as arcuate arteries. What arises from the arcuate arteries are the interlobular arteries, which are seen on either side of the medullary rays. Interlobular arteries. So segmental artery. Lobar branches, interlobar, arcuate artery, interlobular arteries. So segmental lobar, interlobar arteries. Then you have the interlobular arteries. From the interlobular arteries, you have afferent artery hole, which forms the glomerular plexus. Then efferent artery hole. The efferent artery hole breaks up into peritubular plexus. Then from that interlobular veins, arcuate veins, interlobar veins, and finally renal vein, which breaks into inferior vena cava. So that is the major circulation of the kidney. So two plexus, glomerular plexus and peritubular plexus, are seen. So it is also called as renal portal system. So you have one portal vein, which has portal system. The pituitary gland, you have hypo. Facial portal system, even in the renal kidney, you have the portal system. Okay, so that is the renal circulation. Veins, as I told you, from the interlobular veins, arcuate veins, to the lobar veins, segmental veins, and finally they reach the right and left renal veins. Left renal vein is longer and receives also the Right gonadal testicular or ovarian vein. Sorry, left one. Left one receives the left gonadal or testicular vein and left suprarenal vein. Whereas right gonadal vein and right suprarenal vein directly open into the inferior vena cava. That is the venous drainage. Lymphatics they are mainly leading to para aortic or lateral aortic nodes. Coming to the nerve supply of the kidney, sympathetics from T10 to L1, preganglionic fibers they form renal plexus, or sometimes also the the celiac plexus. And subdivision of the celiac plexus is the aorticorenal ganglion. So from there they go and supply the kidney postganglionic fibers from the renal plexus. They supply the kidney. They are mainly responsible for vasomotor function, stimulates the production of renin and control of blood pressure. Okay, the parasympathetics is by the vagus nerve and their function is not clearly known. Okay, so because of the T10 to L1 segments only, the pain also is actually referred along the loin area behind to the groin area and also to the umbilical region. Pain arising from the kidney, renal pain, colic pain. Applied anatomy most common 
is the renal calculi or renal stones may be formed anywhere in the calyces or renal pelvis, ureters, urinary bladder. Immediately obstruction of the urine leading to hydronephrosis. Urine obstruction can also be due to neoplasm, cancers of the kidney or due to any infection it might produce granulomas due to pyogenic infections or necrosis can also occur obstructive uropathy so that is flow of urine is obstructed leading to hydronephros so laden with urine so this is all dilated your uh, renal sinus renal pelvis all gets dilated thereby sometimes renal artery also leads to obstruction so when the renal artery is stenosed then there will be an increase in the blood pressure Stenosis of renal artery leads to increase in blood pressure or systemic hypertension. Then what happens? The renal artery has to be arrested to the splenic artery to relieve the hypertension. So other obstructive neuropathy, as I told you, at the ureters anywhere it might get impacted. Neoplasms of the ureter, stricture formation in the ureter, or thickening of the wall of the ureter, which might also be uh, congenital or impact of renal calculi from the kidney it might move and block along the lumen of the ureter or sometimes growth cancers of the bladder calculi might come and lodge in the bladder all those things leads to obstructive uropathy the lobulated kidneys, kidneys actually develop from beta nephric blastema as lobules and all these lobules fuse and the surface becomes smooth. But sometimes if they don't fuse completely then you see a lobulated kidney, they might also be asymptomatic. Okay, they might be asymptomatic. Next is actually the horse shoe kidney. When the lower poles of the kidney, when they come in close contact with each other, they fuse, forming a horseshoe shape. And the kidney don't ascend to the higher position because the inferior mesenteric artery might actually restrict their ascent. And mostly the kidney might be lying at the lower level, pelvic kidney, when the kidneys fail to ascend because kidneys develop at a lower level and then they ascend above. Then apparent renal arteries, more common in the kidneys, extra or segmental arteries because as the kidney ascend, they derive their blood supply from their corresponding segments. Okay. So additional branches, it might retain leading to apparent renal arteries. Then one more condition is polycystic kidney. The kidney is riddled with numerous cysts. So mainly the secreting and collecting tubules fails to communicate. It is also an autosomal recessive disorder, polycystic kidney. Okay, numerous cysts in the kidney you can come across. Next we will pass on to the ureters. So ureter is a long cylindrical muscular tube, 25 centimeters in length conveys the urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. It has got mainly starting point is actually called as the pelvis of ureter. Then you have the abdominal part of the ureter. Then you have the pelvic part of the ureter. The diameter of the tube is just 3 centimeters. And mainly pelvis, abdominal and pelvic part. Don't confuse pelvis of ureter with the pelvic part of the ureter. Okay. Of course, it has also one more part, intravesicular part. After piercing the wall of the bladder, it also travels deep to the mucosa of the bladder, submucosa. It has also got an intravesicular part, finally opening into the bladder. The pelvis of the ureter covered spread is a broad funnel shaped part of the ureter. It is related to the hilum then passes downwards and medially along the medial border seen along the renal vessels. 
then from there it is continues as the abdominal part. Pelvis of ureter is a funnel shaped broad covered sweat, continues or narrows down as the abdominal part. The place where the pelvis of the ureter continues as the abdominal part is the pelvi ureteral junction, PUJ, the most common site of obstruction because there is naturally a constriction there. A PUJ obstruction might also be congenital because abnormal thickening of the ureter wall might lead to PUJ obstruction. Abdominal part of the ureter, so from the pelvic part, is present in the posterior abdominal wall. It lies in front of the psoas major. You are able to see the ureter. So it actually, front of the psoas major, crosses the common iliac vessels to be continuous as the pelvic part of ureter. Okay, cross the termination of the common iliac artery continuous as the pelvic part, the pelvic brim. So, that uppermost border of the pelvis, bony pelvis, is actually called as the pelvic brim, where it crosses to become the pelvic part of the ureter. So, related anteriorly so to the peritoneum, then it is related anteriorly to the gonadal vessel, second part of duodenum and gonadal vessels. Left ureter again will be related to the left gonadal vessels and nearly crossed by the left gonadal vessels and also by the vessels which are actually supplying the colon, inferior dysentric vessels. Okay. So, left ureter related to left gonadal vessels, colic and sigmoid vessels as I told you branches of inferior dysentric vessels. And the right ureter medially related to the IVC. Pelvic part of ureter from the pelvic brim, it is follows the greater sciatic notch up to the ischial spine. Then from there it turns medially and downwards and oblique course. Okay. From the lateral wall of pelvis, it turns medially and laterally the oblique course forwards and medially to pierce the wall of the bladder which is the superior lateral angle of the urinary bladder. The pelvic part of the ureter is mainly related to the ovary in front and the uterine tubes. Ovary and uterine tubes is present anteriorly. It also forms the posterior superior border of the ovarian fossa. So, ovarian vein syndrome, dilatation of the ovarian vein sometimes might compress the ureter. So, it related in front to the ovary and uterine tubes. In males, it is actually related in front to the vas difference and seminal vesicle. Okay. And the, in females, the uterine artery crosses the ureter from lateral to medial side. The uterine vessels crosses the ureter from lateral to medial side. Mainly, you have to remember three constrictions of the ureter. One is the pelvic ureteral junction, as I told you. The second one, when it is crossing the common iliac vessels at the level of pelvic brim. And the third one is actually when it is piercing the bladder wall. These are the three constrictions of the ureter, they are not mechanically produced because of these structures, they are developmental in origin. Naturally, they are developmentally, you see these three constrictions. The lumen of the ureter is narrow at these three points and they are also the common sites of impact of renal calculi or renal stones. Okay. Blood supply, abdominal part is mainly supplied by the renal artery and gonadal arteries and lumbar arteries, okay, posterior branches of the abdominal aorta, lumbar arteries, gonadal arteries and renal arteries. Pelvic part of the ureter is mainly supplied by the common iliac, internal iliac and external iliac arising from the common iliac and also by the inferior vesicular arteries. In females, in addition, it is supplied by the uterine and vaginal arteries, ureter, that is the blood supply. Abdominal part is by renal, gonadal and lumbar, 
will be part of the external and internal iliac inferior vesicula and in females in addition it is supplied by the ureter and ureter the u ureter and uterine artery and the vaginal artery lymphatics they actually follow the course of the vessels corresponding veins and finally drain into the vena cava system lymphatics abdominal part mainly drain into the para aortic nodes pelvic part they mainly drain into the iliac nodes common external and internal iliac nodes <coughs> nerve supply sympathetics mainly again from the t 10 to l1 segment of the spinal cord to the hypogastric plexus what happens is they reach the ureter parasympathetic is by vagus and pelvis plantic nerves s2 s3 and s4 clinical aspects is obstruction obstructive uropathy or obstruction of the ureters mainly due to impact of renal stones or due to any neoplasm of the ureter or due to compression by external structures like as i told you what is the ovarian vein syndrome so causes colic pain especially when the ureter stone gets impacted or when it is passing through the ureter from the loin to the groin or to the scrotum in case of veins it can extend to the scrotum in case of veins and labia majus in case of females now during hysterectomy the uterine artery crosses the ureter so while ligating the uterine artery accidentally the uterus sorry the ureter might be ligated which should be carefully avoided or sometimes while ligating the ovarian artery infundibulo pelvic ligament sometimes there also it is related to the ovarian fossa carefully we should be the surgeon should be able to secure the uterine ureter if not otherwise if it is cut then anastomosis of the cut part has to be that it has to be anastomosed to the bladder okay but in any case what happens is there is a chance of stricture formation that is what happens narrowing of the lumen due to fibrosis so stricture formation will take place there is a chance which has to be actually continuously monitored if the ureter is ligated accidentally during hysterectomy okay so ureteroscope mainly through the urethra bladder and then what happens is you can actually insert and lithotripsy so lithotripsy is a procedure where the renal calculi can actually removed by breaking it into small pieces so with this i complete the kidneys and ureter thank you very much for your patient listening